and then I'm going to share my screen. Stop sharing, share the screen. This one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, let's get started. Um, uh, very glad that I can see all of you. Um, so today's lecture um, is deviate a bit from uh, the lecture about distributed file system. I will resume that um, on Thursday. However, you will actually see a lot of distributed file system concept. Um, the, the reason I provide this is as a suggestion for um, maybe your final project if you're interested. And uh, I, I can certainly uh, give you a lot more information into uh, the development of this, this concept. Okay, so, so this is called ethical aware computing. I'm going to start it by motivate you about some example about why we need this. But by the way, we actually need two things. The, the first thing is why do we need to have ethical aware computing? Because we saw some application that's actually very important. The second issue, which is not so obvious, but hopefully you will consider this as a possibility is that why ethical aware computing is an operating system concept. Why can we build everything into the application? It's like pretty much like what we did. Um, if you think about operating system, we have historically, we have a two different trend. One is called monolithic kernel. Basically, we want to put more stuff into the kernel, file system, memory management, schedule into the kernel. And the other concept is called micro kernel. Micro kernel is trying to take things out of the kernel, make the kernel service become a services. And then there's a user level stuff. We push a lot of things into user level stuff. So that is actually a little bit different between pushing things to the user level means pushing into the application. So we'll see that why for ethics, it might make more sense regardless this we're considered microkernel or monolithic kernel that we want to take that part out of the application and which for the purpose hopefully by the end of the course by the end of uh, this lecture you start to seeing uh, some of the possible i'm not definitely saying it's the right way to go but there is a possibility option okay so i'm going to use the example i call it um real time instant coupon. So in this kind of example, that there will be uh, facial recognition, there will be a lot of surveillance device in a particular grocery store. And try to understand, or maybe they actually connect with Facebook, Google, it's getting a lot of information about you. And so while you are in the store, you show some sign that you're interested in certain product. And at that moment, basically, I want to come up with a decision. This is a recommendation system. I will issue an instant coupon to your phone right at that moment when you're in front of the product. So this is a little bit more push from, say, you receive a coupon at home or receive an email from Groupon. This is actually a much stronger signal. This is sometimes we call a micro recommendation. It's actually you're getting there. I'm actually giving it to you. And for example, this 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 particular person, um, he has uh, it's a person and then he's interested in a beer. Maybe you know one of the way you can actually see uh, why somebody is interested in a beer because he walked in a homogeneous speed in every single aisle in the grocery store. So whenever he walked by this aisle of alcohol product, he actually slowed down a little bit. Not only that, his facial expression represents something different when he's seeing other kind of product. I mean, this, by the way, this technology is really mature. And uh, to a point, uh, some of the big company in the Bay Area even 
publicly announced. I'm not, we are not going to use this technology. We're not going to develop this technology because of some of the negative concern. But nevertheless, the technology is there. It will continue to be used. I'll, I'll show you that. Okay, so the thing is that um, we, we have a, um, let, me, let me just skip to the next slide. So, so this is the example about whether we should, as a computational system, maybe this is a machine learning decide what to do, but in a real time micro recommendation level, is that whether we should actually issue this, this crew path or not by the computational system. This is obviously not by uh, a human user or very slow pace. This is actually going to be real time. When you walk, that's an opportunity. When you walk into a store, and you present yourself as both a target and both showing some information about your privacy. So um, just tell you that there is, a, let me just ask you, okay, there are two cases that this, this uh, recommendation, for this particular case, I'm just fake the example, okay? This is not a real case, this is a PowerPoint uh, example. Um, if this person, it could be, Price sensitive. So he is really enjoy having something uh, like me. But I will wait until it's on sale to get it. Okay. Well, wait until. So, so I'm a price sensitive person. I, I, if it's a price is good, the deal is good, I will get it. Okay. There is another possibility of me in this case. I'm actually addiction to alcohol. I have actually went through recovery program um, in order for me to get out of that. But nevertheless, somewhere deep in here or in here, there is a tendency when I see this, is a view to me as a big temptation. Okay, so it might be a mix of this too, but I'm actually taking this as a example one, example two. Okay, the, my first question to you is that if I am price sensitive, do you think it's ethical for this coupon to issue to me? Okay, by the way, you probably never, any of you taken courses in ECS 188? Any of you? Okay, good. So you, what? You're the TA, okay, great. So you probably know the difference between utilitarianism and eontology. Okay, so I'm not going to go through some of the definition of ethics, but just based on your your conscious mind, whether this, this so the first example is probably okay. Is at least in our society this is acceptable for most of us, so it's okay. But the second case is probably not ethical. Okay, it's unethical. Somebody already is vulnerable to a certain thing, and then you actually want to do that. Um, it's, it's might not be a good idea. Okay, so, however, this actually triggered to another example. I mean, for, for a company like Display over here, for them to actually know that you are case one and case two, meaning that you're price sensitive or you have any. Uh, history about your addiction. Um, that means I have to invade more of your privacy. If you think about that, sometimes if you think about the first thing, so, so by the way, if you, if you look at my research, I'm highly sensitive to any subject about privacy. I, I feel it's a, it's a threat to, to human society when our privacy is being uh, uh, how do I say that? Compromise in various ways. I mean, for example, if this is a particular company starting with G, okay, uh, now I'm being really, really careful. Um, they, they have all the information to actually know what your interests. So they might derive whether your, your actual addiction or not. Or maybe it's not about you, it's about your family member. But you share the same fridge about this product. So, so you have a family member or your roommate has that issue, then probably you're not even allowed to, to bring that home. 
for example. So, so there is interesting way, of course, the other way is there we can actually just show the proof your medical record to show that some doctor will give you a certificate whether you are or you are not under that particular. You can actually, this is a simple example, but you think about this can be applied to so many things that computationally we will be able to enjoy the benefit, but on the other hand, we might lose some of the privacy because we have to give away a lot of things. Okay, so to make these things more complicated, this became a really interesting issue because it's not just one particular point, such as grocery store is watching you. In fact, it's essentially is connecting between the fridge in the grocery store to fridge in your home or in your dormitory. And, and the thing is that if you think about this, is that um, what, what's happening is whatever, think about it, this is actually later you will see that we're exactly using iNode to handle it. So, so when you learn iNode, it's not just about indexing the hardest block. Uh, it's actually iNode, you can use it for a lot of other uh, contexts. So in, in this case, we're actually talking about a box of beer. That's actually you somehow possess from the grocery store. Guess what? You actually take this box of beer home and put it in your fridge or put your some kind of storage. And the thing is that how you're going to remember or analyze the information about how the target or the object is being mobilized in our society, in our community, versus the people who actually will have access to each of the storage and how they're interacting with that. If you think about that, this is a really rich amount of information for us to actually make a better decision as an ethic, but it at the same time exposed a even greater amount of privacy information. So, so what we try to do is we try to see what, how do we actually be able to preserve the privacy? And then we'll be able to help our user to actually make a ethical decision. And as, as, a, as a research project, to be honest, because there is another issue which um, academic research, we actually don't know what's going to happen. Um, because sometimes there is a social impact, economic impact, and the situation can get really, really complicated. But we're actually trying to study this under the operating system context. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to, um, to handle two things. On one hand, we want to be able to um, understand the physical presence of the people because there is another thing which is important. We gradually realize there are two kinds of uh, computational model. One is totally virtual. Either it's totally in a virtual reality world or it's actually in a world you can actually create uh, lots of fake account and just pretend to be somebody else. And by the way, that part of the world personally um, I might actually mention this, that, that this is my, the other part of my research. I realized that has been really, really um, unfruitful for our society. Meaning that there is a, a, another company started with F. Um, they have a 2 billion user and just sometime in 2019, they said they eliminate 3.4 billion. So it's basically a company with 2 billion active users, they, they, within six months, they eliminated 3.4 billion accounts. You can see that there's a lots of interesting thing people create, fake account, try to influence um, a AI or machine learning computational algorithm, social, we call it social algorithms, which try to alter, again, the recommendation. Okay, and, and I will explain to you why I think the physical presence is actually not only fit better with our society, but also is more secure. 
on you, you, you can think why I'm talking about this and guess what was happening after 2019. What's the big event you think in the social algorithm care after 2019? I mean, I have to build up, it's an election. The election is next one. Think about what happened in 2016 election. Have you heard about something called Cambridge? You must heard about Cambridge Analytica. And, and 2020, that's actually another big issue over there. Okay, so the thing is that we, I actually, uh, in fact, after I spent so much time in the 2019, 2020 dealing with that, I actually, at the same time, realized the vulnerability of that kind of cy pure cyber system. So I'm actually looking at a more into a cyber physical in this sense. And at the same time, I want to actually be able to make sure we protect the privacy. So the, the model, I should actually talk about this. Let me actually see that. Uh, the, the model I actually have is that there are, there are three devices in this. So there's a cloud, there's an edge device, a sensor in the grocery store, and then there is your smartphone. And uh, typically, you interact with that edge device, and guess what? That edge device is actually using your favor of 5G, or right now, when I talk to my uh, sponsor, they're talking about 6G network right now. So they want to provide the high network bandwidth, try to snip out every single information into their heart so they can actually do something. So in my mind, the first thing I need to cut off is I wanted to show you how I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna cut off that link between the cloud and edge device. So meaning that if I have a sensor and an edge device, it's actually getting my information regardless is my facial recognition when I look at a box of beer or is because I'm actually willing to submit my medical record to prove that I actually is uh, not vulnerable to alcohol. And I'm actually interacting with the edge device. It's okay. And all that interaction need to be kept on my side of the story. And nobody else should know that. So that's kind of the model that uh, gradually I'm kind of lured into. Okay. And of course, that's just one person. But this model will be more complicated when you have a group of people that's actually interact with you. So this is not just an individual user, but it's a group of user, they both share some of the data, and how do we actually control that? That's actually getting really, really complicated. And the case I will, uh, to be honest, this is a case I'm working on right now, is I think it's a very clear case that when you have somebody with alcohol addiction, you shouldn't recommend. But how about this is in the gray area? Because a lot of the ethical decision we're going to take is actually in a, what I call gray area. It means that there are theory or there are study showing both sides. It might not be extreme, but showing that, hey, this might be okay, this is not okay. I mean, basically when we study ethics, the extreme, Thou shalt not kill, for example, this, this side. You shouldn't murder anybody, that's clear. Or there is certainly good thing that you should be doing. But the majority of the decision we need to face every day is actually in the middle. And the thing is that we're going to study this as an example to show you a little bit more. Okay, what happened? If a, it, it's, a, it's a woman, uh, pregnancy, and shall we recommend? some um, even light uh, beverage contain alcohol to this particular customer. Okay. All right, I'm going to, um, to talk about uh, this system. I, I call it ethicus. Um, I, I call it ethical aware, the operating system support for um, ethical aware computing. So I'm actually first going to talk about a, a network environment which is, you will see uh, why I designed it that way uh, in contrast to what I already show you. And then I talk about under this model, what can I do with the application? And then I'm actually moving to talk about the kernel itself, okay? So the environment I have, if you look at the yellow, the yellow is what we have today. 
essentially everything is connected. If there was any sensor in this room, try to watch. I mean, Zoom is actually the edge device, right? Try to uh, analyze, at least they have the raw data and then they can actually do something like that. So what, what I try to propose here is that I try to make what I call disconnected internet. So essentially I have a bunch of what I call standalone device. Those device, I mean, I'm using this picture of Raspberry Pi because that's, that's my development environment. It's cheap, it's powerful. It has some basic network connectivity in layer two. Um, you can, of course you can do layer three, but the thing is that now I'm saying that, okay, all this device, I want to make sure they're not connected to the yellow. They're disconnected. And the thing is that you can connect each of this as some sensor. You can connect um, air quality sensor. You can connect camera and you can connect uh, any kind of memory or computational storage for information. For example, you can use this as a mailbox in your dormitory to Sarah. And what you can do is, okay, I want to send an email to you. And typically what, what you do today, you have to get their email address and send it out, right? Well, when you send an email out in the SMTP server, guess what? There's a lot of consequence. Number one, somebody can watch over that. I know, remember, I'm a, I'm a very, very privacy sensitive person. And somebody is going to watch that. The second thing is that while well, there are spam and scam, all of them coming from the rest of the world. By the way, any of you from Russia? Russia. No, I, I have a high respect for people from Russia, just to let you know, because they're hackers of best. They just sit in the lab and find out the one single bug in Microsoft operating system or even Linux device driver. They can compromise billions of bytes at a time. They can sniff information, they can send all kinds of information such that you will be some of us, not all of us. I think all of you are okay, but me, I'm particularly vulnerable, that I will get tricked to, to, to their skin. Well, you can do email this way. Instead of sending the email to SMTP, if I want to connect with you, I would just walk to one of the Raspberry Pi device in Tercero. I just deposit my email to you and maybe encrypt it using some public key, private key. That's okay. On top of that. So you actually want to check your email for the friend you really know. In this community, when you come home from a car, you actually just your phone next to that, you actually download all the email that's actually being deposited. Okay, the reason this disconnect from internet is that now, if somebody wants to attack you, this person must be physically here. It cannot be anybody from the internet. I, I would say there are some exceptions. They can mobilize a person and then use his network to do that. But I'm actually going to. So the, the computational model looks like this. If I want to, access to that device, you have to move it yourself there. Or somebody has to move there and order for your phone to be able to interact with that device. This is basically the disconnected internet. So now I'm saying that, well, what happened? I mean, computation, we always know, the basic need is try to move the information from A to B, or, or try to erase the information from A and then uh, change this information or the format of the information and not a box. That's very simple, right? So, okay, how do I actually move something information from device A to device C? How do I do that? There are two ways to do that, okay? One way to do that is like this. Um, I pick up the information from A, from Tessero, and then I go to NU. And then I upload that information to the other device. So the one person mission, and I can actually move this information. Okay, that's option number one. Option number two, this is called multi-party communication or communication. I actually call my friend because I feel uh, MU is too far. Um, but I know one of my friends is actually, remember, most of the friends, they are still connecting with this yellow. So they have a way to communicate. It's very simple. I can actually get my friend and say, hey, 
can you actually move to near this device C? Well, I'm actually moved to device A. And we both actually connect to the yellow. And now we actually be able to have a communication between A and C. So essentially, we're, we're using this kind of paradigm that's actually have a disconnected internet, but we actually like to use the mobility of human user to fill the gap in order to um, perform the computation. Okay, there, there are two things I should, I should say that. This paradigm is not suitable for all the application. If you want to watch a movie in Netflix, and you want your friend to actually just run back and forth to move the block. That's not very helpful, okay? As, especially this one uh, is not good for watching uh, Netflix. This one may be okay, but this one is not good, okay? So um, this is not good for all application, number one. Number two, um, the property about this paradigm is because it involves human, so it's particularly suitable for application where human mobility align well with the objectives of your computation. So it means that these two actually go together, that you actually bring the human being as, as the core of the computation. So, so let me actually say, what do I mean by bring the human into the core of the computation? We actually participate in a lot of computation peripheral. Peripherally means that you actually uh, use your smartphone. You might not even need to do too much, okay? And the computation will happen anyway. Social algorithm, they will sniff your information, other information. They will be able to statistically decide what is the outcome of the information with or without your participation. So you're, we are participating peripheral. But in this model, the computation means that we are we became the necessity of the computation, meaning that if we were not there, the computation won't happen. So that's that's the, the kind of thing is that well, I want the computation to happen. That's the goal, objectives of our computation. And then that needs to be aligned with the human mobility, means that I'm actually interested in actually supporting that. So, so I will actually explain why this is not connected to ethical work. I will explain to you a, 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 a detail by the time. But the thing is that now we are actually not rely on a computational system to make an ethical decision. Because to be honest with you, I will challenge you. Any of, I know many of you are very familiar with machine learning or AI algorithm to have collect a lot of the data set to actually determine whether this is ethical or not is very difficult, if impossible. Somebody might be able to prove theoretically this is impossible for a computation to actually be able to, to make an ethical decision without significant bias, without significant noisy information or information being attacked. It's really hard. So, I compromised that to actually work on this. I said, okay, if we can bring human being into the computation, then essentially the ethical perspective of that computation will be determined by the potential ethical decision made by the people who are involved in the computation. And that's basically involved the, the human being into this. So um, you will gradually see how this is going to be putting together. But there was some application that we already start developing. Uh, this was started with uh, my uh, offering of ECF 36D. I tried to push students to think about innovative idea that how they can actually develop application to uh, based on this platform. So I mean, I just go through uh, a couple of them. Let me let me pick which one is actually a, a, a easier one for me to say. Um, Okay, there is a there is an electronic voting. The electronic voting one means that um, typically today there are two options for you to do voting. One is you go to in person, go to the um, um, the voting office, 
or you mail in your, your ballot. And the other way is doing electronic voting. I mean, if you, if you know Professor uh, Matt Bishop's work, and he is the world leader in how do we actually design such a uh, nice, uh, secure uh, voting system. But nevertheless, the best electronic voting system over the internet has some possibility that's actually can be compromised. So in other words, what we develop in that project, for example, electronic local, you see I now use local voting, means that I'm actually, you don't have to go to the, the, um, um, the, the, the voting office, say in the wire force or in post office, but instead, I'm actually going to place a bunch of this kind of disconnected respiratory pot. And you actually interact with that. And then during that computation, you verify with a not online office. So we kind of hybrid that and such that we can actually guarantee a much better security property for that voting process. And let me just give you one more example, then I'm, I, I think I need to talk about operating system perspective of this, this system. Um, let's talk about the banking. How, I just wonder, how do you actually get access to your bank information? How do you actually access to that? For me, I'm a customer of Chase and I log into www.chase.com. So essentially that's my direct access to my information over there. I can actually see my transaction over there. I can actually convert some of the online uh, activity. I can actually wire transfer to some other account. So that, that's actually what, what I have been doing. Okay, so as, as, uh, that's why I asked, is there any person from uh, Russia? over here. I mean, they are very good. They actually found a way to be able to compromise either from your machine or from the server in those big corporate. And they actually be able to establish a large scale compromise based on the number of account they can access. And they can actually do just maybe a little bit. They, they won't do like a per account, they won't transfer a large amount of money, but just small amount, but just aggregate, they can actually make a lot out of that. And, and there is a lot of the criminal side about our society is getting really innovative. They are leveraging any kind of software vulnerability, um, even the small one, they can actually cash that out and then really, really hurt us uh, in a large scale. So in the, in the banking issue, we also rely on human. So say I, I travel to say Australia and I want to access my bank information. So I say, okay, I don't want to do um, um, this kind of web. Okay, in fact, I design such that uh, if Chase will listen to me, by the way, that all the bank information is on the store of that Raspberry Pi. Is this connected from the internet? And in order for me to access, I have to ask my trusted friend or relatives, he or she is still in Davis. I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Australia. And he has to actually walk to the bank for me to be able to access to that. We have to, of course, deal with the kinds of difference issue. But this computation is compromise between the possibility of being globally compromised versus that I'm actually introduced some inconvenience into the competition. And such that is for my account is me and another person. Two of us have to be here. That's what multi-part computation, two person. And then I can actually do everything I want. So this, I argue that why this one of the group from the CIA gave them a really high grade because they actually make a case. This is a lot harder for any hacker to, to take care of that. Because there are, by the way, the hacker always can compromise this two sector. One is compromise the software or hardware, the, the whatever, the usual suspect you will learn from a computer security class. 
And the other part is compromise the human. So my argument is compromising the first category. Once you compromise one, you compromise a billion. But human, you compromise one or two, you just compromise two. So there is a scale difference in that design. So I trade off involve more human. I mean, by the way, if that person is my wife, she would like to know what I did anyway. So, so the thing is I have to report to her. So maybe just ask her to go to the bank. Okay, a little bit joking here. All right. So essentially this competition has, I, I kind of summarized all this application being developed into four categories of project. One is uh, what I call alibi service. So how do you actually show that you actually was there at some time? With that, this, so all the services based on this connected internet um, scenario. For example, voting. You have to show you're here. You did the vote. You're the one who actually votes in the, in the Tercero, that in front of that camera. And how do you do that? And the second category is that how do you do real time recommendation, like what I did for that uh, um, coupon for, uh, for beer. And then you have this multi party communication, which means that you need to coordinate a bunch of people. By the way, that has a huge application, meaning that you're not actually connecting each other with what we call outside social network. You're connecting yourself with real friendship, real network, real relationship to complete the competition. It is not going to be 100% convenient, but it has other merit that for us to include. And then you can do the other thing we call object tracking. I mentioned this a, a little bit. For example, when you're moving a box of beer from grocery store to go to the fridge, and then you actually ask the member to take some of the product somewhere else. This has actually become really interesting. The, the idea has uh, many plays for recycling business, but the, 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 the thing that's actually hit me um, during last quarter was the food bank service. I don't know if you heard about food bank. The food bank is actually help those low income families that they will be able to um, distribute the food to support their needs. And, and you can imagine that the current struggle with that is essentially, if you have some food, you want to donate. Well, by the way, what, what do you think you, you should donate to the food bank? By the way, my, my daughter uh, working, I shouldn't tell you which church, but there is a big church. They are running a food bank service. I walk in to the, the storage. They actually uh, store all the food for the food bank. There are 14 then is helping the whole Bay Area about distributing the food. Um, I smell banana when I walk in the room. It's a good thing, but there was a lots of banana. So it means that there was a supply of banana that's actually going to support the service. But what other things? Do we, do we actually know what, what kind of things those low-income family really need for nutrition, for balance, for other things? And, and the thing is that it's, it's actually starting with that group of students. It turned out his family, her family is also uh, part of the food bank uh, service that um, they realize it's very interesting to be able to track what kind of things the family doesn't need, what kind of things they really need. And then for that information, how do you actually convince the donor to actually be able to match that, that both direction? And that's actually up to tracking because I actually need to, I mean, that's why in that project, we actually decide we need to have a smart fridge. When we talk about smart fridge, we not talk about those very expensive ones in the industry. We're talking about a regular fridge with a raspberry pot. And then with some kind of camera, some kind of very uh, inexpensive commodity power, be able to, do some kind of check-in, check-out about how the food is being consumed in that particular refrigerator. Okay, so that's, you can see that there's a lots of interesting things we can do. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the, um, the core of the design. 
It's called EFS. I call it ethics, ethical or ethics uh, file system. And essentially, the file system needs to do two things. The, the, the simple one is that I need to be able to store my information. So whenever I go to a food bank or go to voting or go to Tessero to do all kinds of vacation, now remember, all this information is not going to be taken by one particular cloud provider or one application provider because then I will have one single point of failure and then I will be uh, easily uh, get tracked about one. So I want to control that information. I'm the owner of that information, by the way. And that information needs to be stored in a file system. So that, that's the first, first part we need to do. Um, but the second part, which I'm actually going to tell you is that really the file system is really the file system how we engage human mobility. Because the whole thing we're talking about is human mobility. The whole computation will work if I don't have a person that's willing to follow this in order for them to actually make the right move. So, okay, I try to balance. I already spent 40 minutes. Let's, let's try to, uh, before I, I move on, any question from local or remote? Any question? Okay, you can watch the video after that if you don't understand any other question. Okay. So I'm going to start talking about I know. Okay, so this is I know that we know. So what is I know? I know is really you have an application. If you want to access some information, you should go to that I know. And I know is actually pointers. A lot of pointer, of course, if the file is big. But nevertheless, is a pointer. It's a pointer to a particular location which in our traditional operating system context is just a pointer to a particular disk block. But it can also point in to a remote disk block. I mean, right now we're talking about distributed file system. I mean, single file system, the disk block is basically to device driver to your whatever SSD drive, that particular block, I know number. But that could be a distributed system. It's actually pointing at some information or memory at a device A. The only difference now is that my I know will be looks like this because I do not have a network connection. So guess what? I have to actually pointing at a person. The I know is actually pointing at a person in the computation. And that person has to move over there. So, so essentially that pointer become not a static pointer. That became a pointer that has a lot. That's actually need to do something. So essentially that's not no longer a number that represents a block. But that number is actually associated some action for that person to move to a certain place in order to do that. Okay. To make things more complicated, it's actually now we have to do some ethical decision because this person in this picture, assuming I want to get this part of information, there is something called ethical where application, you see that this is basically the kernel. So any application try to perform the computation like Tell you about this disconnected operation. They need to actually contact the EMS. They say, "Hey, um, I want to actually be able to interact with this device." Um, and the thing is that, please help me to find the people that can actually connect to that. And that person is actually going to make a decision because you have a choice as an autonomous human being to decide whether you want to participate or not. And therefore, there is an ethic engine, which I'm going to tell you in much more detail. And that's basically the core of the development. And the thing is that that particular 
engine is actually going to interact with the user who is a part of that computation to decide whether he needs to do that. Okay, so that, that's, that's the, the first part. We kind of make that simple pointer became a more complicated uh, routing uh, involved human to actually accomplish that. Okay, so, so let me actually just want to go through some of the detail over here in the in the green box. So there is a few things which uh, this is our design goal, which we can implement. Um, when you actually try to access the information for box A, we actually um, separate the notion of shareable and non-shareable resource. So for example, if you have a hard disk and this block represents your um, software binary code to execute say Zoom program. And this is shareable because everybody actually can go there to grab it. But what do I mean by non-shareable? Non-shareable means that it can only be used once. So there is some information, for example, I have a, a hard copy, sorry, hard copy, soft copy of a ticket to go to a particular uh, NBA playoff. It's a soft copy there, or, or like uh, 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 Bitcoin. And the thing is that it can only be spent once. So it's an information, but it's a non shareable, meaning that you can only get it once. But when I talk about shareable, I'm actually even talk about deeper than that. In this case, what's not shareable? A box of beer is not shareable. So in this information, in this system, by the way, that pointer point to that device. It might not be a hard disk. It might be a box of beer. So essentially, when I have operating system managing shareable or non-shareable resources, I'm not just talking about hard disk. I'm actually talking about all the possible physical resource as well. Because when I actually move from device A to device C, some information, remember I said I want to move device A to device C as a fundamental computational concept. Um, that to non-shareable is I actually move a box of beer from grocery store to my smart fridge at home. It's not shareable when I take it out, that device, that resource is no longer there. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the application we're talking about. The second point I want to tell you about this architecture is that the, even though the ethic aware application is actually instruct the user to actually be able to access to that information, but that information might not need to go back to ethic aware application. So essentially, the ethicware application is only instruct the person to get connected, but that information might not actually go back to that. I will explain to you why this feature is important because um, it's involved privacy, basically, but there is other good reason. So essentially, this information can be directly transferred to another, uh, another uh, either device or another human node that's actually going to complete the whole computation. And that's the second thing. And the third important requirement about this design is that we want to make sure that every single information transaction in this picture is trackable for each individual user. So if you are actually in that person, he's moving over there, then there are certain part of information that you need to actually track it. You want to know whether you got request to help this computation. And then before you participate, you should also be given the information whether you will be able to see the outcome of the computation. So in a lot of this application, what we realize is that if, if I just say, hey, I give you the, my, my blend check and I help, 
but I trust the outcome is as you said. At the moment, you gave me the, the check to sign. Then it might be too naive. I will be more comfortable if you actually have a trackable information in this file system that I can actually track that how this particular information is really being compute exactly as what I have seen earlier. Of course, this will including the privacy consideration as well. Okay. Okay, so that give you a high level picture about what the file system, what is the service trying to provide. It's essentially try to let the application to be able to instruct the service of EFS. And the EFS will be able to connect with the human subject in this computation to do the things they autonomously need to decide whether they want to participate, which means that sometimes you have to actually invite multiple uh, subjects. Some of them will work, some of them will not work. And the thing is that the important thing is we will have the capability to be able to keep tracking what's going on. And furthermore, it's important, there is an ethic engine, which I'm going to talk about. Before I talk about ethic engine, I want to just briefly say, well, why bother to have another FS? I mean, EC has 251 students already, a lot of work they need to learn. They have to learn UFS, FFS, uh, AFS, NFS, NTFS, NFS. A lot of file systems you need to learn. And then there was a GFS. Um, but why there is another file system? Why can't we have a application specific? Meaning that if this is for grocery, why not we just develop a picture for nothing or safe one? And why do we want to develop a, a kernel like a service to support it all? Just because I want to publish another paper or something like that? Probably not. All right. So the reason is that let me give you an example. If, if today, I actually uh, got an um, application from a particular company uh, starting with letter A. And this company is claimed they have ethic recommendation. So basically we recommend me to buy this stuff that's actually ethical or the application is really going to be uh, doing well for my life. In my work, but the company really worked hard to actually make that happen. That company hasn't done that yet. I mean, just unfortunately, but um, they try. They try to. I mean, essentially, all the company they are actually under what I call a conflict of interest. Whether they 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 actually want to boost the economics or they want to sacrifice that economics to how much in order to put you as a customer as the first line of consideration. Do I want to actually let my company survive and my stockholder is happy? And, and yet, I actually will always think the best for the customer. Probably very challenging. Probably very challenging. In fact, I actually argue um, a lot. Um, if, if you listen to my previous talk, I always argue that for a company to make their system, make their product uh, ethical, is actually a very good marketing strategy this day. It has some benefit, but unfortunately, to have a competition system. Everything owned by the same company trying to make an actual decision to you. At the same time, they're actually going to make money out of you. That's actually hard for some of us, at least some of us, to actually really trust the, the whole system. Therefore, the, the thinking is that the ethic engine and the whole service must be independent. The other thing about independent is that that independence 
gave us opportunity to protect the privacy. Otherwise, that particular company started with A, will have all the information, will have edge over any other competitor. When they have that economically, it's actually bad for the society. Okay, so it's complicated, I'm not going to that. But hopefully you see that there is a, there is a need for us to separate that out. While the company is making money, trying to fit into the agenda of ethics, we try to provide a system to have a privacy for the user to control themselves. And then they will be able to uh, listen to an independent piece of code called um, ethic engine, which I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so uh, let, let me just very summarize what we're doing is that um, so far on the cover is, uh, is architecture. Is architecture basically uh, just rely on human mobility and the internet is not uh, connected. And then we have a privacy and also the trust for that. Okay, and that's, that's basically, uh, I mean, when we talk about this, we actually look at um, the, the 5G or 6G. Um, any of you from College of Agriculture and Environment? You know, UC Davis is an Abbey school. And I, the, the one interesting, I would say ridiculous proposal I heard just last week is that they're actually thinking about building what we call smart agriculture. And the smart agriculture basically say they need to build 5G into the farmland. And I don't know, any of you working on 5G network? 6G network. You know that those kind of tower, 5G, 6G, the reason they have to be um, um, high bandwidths, that the tower has to be closer in that. And the power has to be strong enough to deliver that amount of information. That's actually very expensive. And what I what I told them is that you want to have a the third bullet, pervasive computing without internet infrastructure, without a infrastructure like 5G or 6G. All I need, you, I said, you just put a Raspberry Pi there. And then you actually connect the solar panel to make sure that the power is sustainable. That's all you need to actually be able to handle this. When I do collect information, I'm actually sending my drone or sending my autonomous vehicle to actually be able to collect the information. And then basically the problem is much easier to cover the area such as Yosemite or forest without actually thinking about how close I need to build my uh, tower and electricity and everything else. Okay, that's basically what we try to do. Okay, so I'm actually going to focus on the, the engine, the ethic engine to actually tell you what's, so I'm not going to tell you the whole thing about the ethic engine, but I'm going to talk about a particular part. And this particular part is actually, I'm using the example of Kubernetes. So essentially we have um, the user who actually want to actually coming in. And this user, should this user receive this particular coupon or not, just like what I uh, presented earlier. And the thing is, I want to talk about is this box, the ethic reasoning box, which is what I call the gray area. Um, so of course, how do I actually decide? This is something ethical for you to do. There are multiple sources for that decision to be made. You can actually uh, listen to uh, uh, a particular YouTube video, or you can actually go to uh, social media to see other people, their feeling or their uh, uh, emotion when they hear you say you want to make this decision. So that, that's actually, a source of the decision. You can actually share an opinion, but that tend to be unreliable and also emotional. So the first part for us to look at this ethical engine is that, okay, we want very strong scientific evidence 
for us to actually be able to uh, push into the recommendation. Essentially, what we are saying is that if you want to have a recommendation, you should actually present what's the scientific result on this issue. It could be unanimously everybody agree that this is a bad thing, but it could be 99% saying that this is a good thing, but 1% still scientific uh, study saying that it is actually uh, the other way. So ultimately, we as autonomous um, decision maker, we need to receive as comprehensive as possible about the information related to the subject that we're going to make. And based on that, then we can actually decide. So, so maybe there's a 99% and there's a 1%. But the thing is that I actually, if I care, I actually will use that 1% to actually look at the original source and to see what's going on. Let me actually give you some example before I look at this. So regarding, um, regarding the pregnancy woman, whether she is entitled to have some alcohol. This is actually a scientific report uh, published in 2013. It basically say if you're doing a light drinking, you're doing a light drinking, they actually did this for um, many years, at least 11 years. And then they said, um, the, uh, it seems to be there's no harm for the baby until they're 11 years old. Okay, so there was a scientific, Study with data to actually support that this 2013 report. But then, in after seven years, there's another report uh, basically contradict that. This report just published uh, a little bit more than one year ago. It basically said even low level of alcohol usage is actually impact the, the brain development. Of, of so, so basically you can see this, not only we want to get the scientific as a backup, but we have to be careful about the new result, the new uh, scientific evidence that being revealed, that those need to be somehow um, organized and collected for us to actually, to be, basically help the user. I mean, the thing is that, what I'm saying is that if you want to issue a coupon or you want to decide whether you want to take this, if I only show you 2013 report, you probably will think that it's, it's okay for you to actually do that. It's ethical. But there's a new scientific result just come out. I'm sorry, that might balance out your view on this issue when you want to do that. Okay, so the ethic engine essentially is a natural language processing program. So we use, uh, I mean, this is just our first um, uh, implementation. We use the word in that. So we basically harvest all the scientific article related to the subject we're interested. So essentially we're gonna do this for every single subject that we think that we're interested to handle. So essentially, if you think about what, what's different between I usually use this to say just one sentence to explain what Epic Engine is really doing. So we know about uh, Wikipedia. So what is Wikipedia? Wikipedia is actually providing a summarization about a lot of scientific study or political science study, uh, social science or, or physical science. And it actually summarizes for you to actually read, say within this topic, what are the issues that's actually important, relevant. That's repeating. So what Ethic Engine is really a very incremental addition to that. So instead of having a human editing process for that Wikipedia document, we're using a automated process to look at the article and then from there, we're actually generating the information which equivalent 
to a Wikipedia supposed to generate, but it generating a way that's more objective because it's no human user, it's just extracting the phrases. Um, and, and, and by the way, extracting um, scientific article is a lot easier than extracting similar content from a social media discussion because over there is more emotional. You, some of you are doing uh, psychological linguistics, you might know the difficulty level. But the important thing about difference between Wikipedia and what we're doing is that Wikipedia, the target is for human user. And over here, we actually take this computation, meaning that the result, the whole analysis is going to fit into the ethical where computed. For them to actually make a recommendation and make an explanation and reason that why this decision is made. So go back to the original example about the pregnant women uh, situation, whether we want to issue a, um, a beer coupon. So just a simple, simplified uh, reason is that the the ethic engine may just decide not to issue the coupon, to be honest with you, in that case, because based on the report, that's actually probably there's a risk that's actually going to hurt some of these brands. And based on analysis, past certain probability, this is not going to be issue the coupon. Guess what? The beer company that's actually uh, asked uh, the, 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 say, nothing to actually sell their product if they know that's your decision, they got very upset. That's why I said that's another reason I want this to be independent of the grocery store. But you can also do the same thing. If, if it's, remember, this is a gray area. Gray area means that based on the analysis, I mean, based on this war embedding, I mean, some of you might familiar with the technology war embedding. The war embedding essentially is making the different concept into a topological uh, space so I can measure the distance. And if, if actually alcohol to the, to the healthy or healthy or to the pregnancy is actually really in the gray area, is in between based on all the scientific articles, and what the system should do is they actually will issue, still issue a coupon, but with a warning. With a warning saying that this is the opinion in this group of salt. This is this part. You actually need to take a look at this before you accept using this particular um, coupon you're being issued to you. Okay? So that's that's the, the, the basic idea is essentially try to obtain um, the, all the facts we can found continuously for the, the topics that you are interested in. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip this part. I don't have a lot of time, sorry. 10 minutes. Okay, so basically this is the, uh, um, I hope you get a, a, a kind of a concept about how to uh, how this will be developed. So I want to actually just tell you that why I said there is a um, a, a like a, a project opportunity. So this project is actually at the very early stage of design. In fact, our implementation is very very uh, preliminary. There is a lot of hope. Uh, for example, just just give you the, the file system part um, is actually no more complicated than the simple um, like a, I know or NFS kind of uh, implementation. The ethics awareness engine is actually being uh, implemented by our collaborator that will actually join us very quickly. Um, and then, pretty much all the tracking part, the tracking part and the human mobility part is actually still being developed. For example, how do I actually build the application and the communication protocol to actually be able to 
include the, the user with their GPS location. And then we still need to worry about the, um, their um, privacy. That part is actually still in the PowerPoint um, uh, stage right now. So if you're interested, there is multiple uh, opportunity. You can actually try to be um, a early uh, contributor to this project. I mean, this is just an option. I want to say that if you have, I mentioned that final project, um, a lot of you might have your own project, which is with your master uh, thesis or PhD thesis, as long as they are related to operating system. But if this is related to operating system, you can see that that boundary is pretty, pretty broad, just, just let you know. And if you want to actually get to know this, and please let me know, okay? So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I have about eight minutes left. I just wonder if you, there is any question. Yes, please. Yeah, so um, you did mention that there will be a person who will do the manual work. Right. So what if this person leaks the information what product they have? So you said what? What if, see the person has to deliver uh, a beer and what if this person leaks this information to a uh, say beer company? Right, okay. So in this model, that is definitely uh, possible to happen. Um, but this model also needs to have a trackability to see if this things happen we will know who actually leaked that out. I think that is a good compromise because uh, otherwise we cannot trust. So we, we basically do a, a, a trust and share, very well, trust and very well. Yeah. What's the term I forgot? Yeah. But that, that's the, that's the, it's a good question. Yeah, in the system, there will be, um, there will be people that's that's actually not trustworthy after a while. Um, but that's that's actually good because part of the um, recommendation about the social mobility is actually to understand this person's track record. If, if somebody um, already being suspicious about revealing some of the information, then in the future that this person will have uh, less, we're not holding anything negative to that person, but that person might have a less opportunity to have to participate. Yeah. So essentially that person have like a lower social media score or something, like a social score than people who rate higher. Okay, you, you touch another issue that I, I I, I don't have a solution, but let me tell you that. I don't think it's appropriate to have a social score for anybody. I, I think that needs to be uh, based on experience. So it means that there's no global social score, but there will be personal social preference. Means that if this is, I just give you an example. If I actually ask, uh, say, my wife to uh, help me to, to in the bank to do that multi party indication, I might be able to do it next time. Say, hey, I want my the other friend to do that. I might have a private uh, preference. By the way, that information, the reason I say that is that all this information cannot be in, the, in one big. Uh, corporate to collect this information. That would defeat the whole purpose. But instead, each individual one, some of us, we actually collect our own view of what's going on. But say you and me, excuse me, sorry, use your example, we both interact with you and we can actually uh, correlate our information and decide whether we want to involve him for the next mission. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I was going to say, Self-regulating like people who have like a personal lowest score, like maybe they could be themselves to be untrustworthy most of the time. Like, would they would they be able to gain access to the system or that excluding them? They they can still um they should be able to still um use the system. 
I mean, the, 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 the thing that's a good question. How, what is the policy about who? I also think the policy needs to be local. For example, you could have a policy within a, a dormitory, but even that, we have to be very careful because how about forgiveness? You probably know that GDPR. I mean, a lot of this, by the way, if you take a you should know what GDPR is. Global data uh, um, GDPR protection regulation is essentially there was a part of that called uh, right to be forgotten. Right to be forgotten means that you did something bad. And after a certain time, that that particular piece of fact is unsearchable. It's not saying that, okay, that one. Okay, I can directly say the company's name. So essentially, if you actually kill somebody in, say, uh, um, York, uh, Euro County, sorry, I suddenly forgot what's the county name. We're in, we're in Euro County. So I kill somebody in Euro County. And the thing is, there's a report saying on uh, February 1st that I actually murdered somebody else. That's, that's the news. That news is actually going to the court with a local newspaper. Those things can always be there. But Google, now I said Google, right? But Google cannot, after a certain period of time, must remove the link to access to that article. This is called right to be forgotten. Meaning that this is not touching the source, but say I moved to Seattle. And, and now I move into a neighborhood and my neighbor want to understand me, they just write down my name. Oh, you murdered somebody in Euro County 22 years ago. That's already a, a unfair uh, situation for him. That's a totally controversial about right to be forgotten. I mean, right to be explained, right to be forgotten. There's a lot of interesting European Commission. They actually, they got, there's 80 pages uh, reading document if you're interested is just look at GDPR. I mean, GDPR actually turned every single company up and down in 2018, 2017 because they have to comply to that. And then Google is, is being um, the, the issue. I think the European Commission asked Google to remove about 4 million link because of that. It's, 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 it's not removing the, the county record, it's removing the searchable. So, so in the same thing, what related to a topic, that actually, how do we actually build the system when the student uh, next year when they come back, I mean, should we still remember him as being not so uh, nice on last year? Yeah, I mean, of course, move from rural county to Seattle. That's 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 even that actually that that's actually still arguable. And you should see that, that that argument, that debate on that issue. You think about it, it's highly controversial. Google certainly don't believe that's that's in fact in some sense I support Google. Essentially, right to be forgotten. Essentially, your your um disallow certain people to access the information about somebody's trustworthiness. How do we actually really do that? I, I, I actually, I like right to be forgotten, but on the other hand, there are cases which is highly sensitive. Yeah. We have a question back there. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, I'm so, so confused about what kind of information is being stored in the Raspberry Pi, because it says like, uh, the person has to gather the information from like, look, uh, network, then keep it to themselves and then pass it on to the Raspberry Pi. Right, right. So, so the thing is that all the information that you can access to Raspberry Pi, you can actually request to be removed. So, so think about that. I mean, the simple case is, is, a, is a beer. Remember the information no longer cyber information could be physical. It's a beer when I purchase is removed, right? That's, that remove is not just remove the beer, but remove all the information for them to see my face, to see all this interaction I have with that beer, I actually look using this part of the eyes to look at that beer. That information needs to be removed. Yeah, that that's that's kind of uh, that. By the way, is a, is a very uh, um, excellent uh, question. 
also already say current our design is that it started with what we call transaction. When when the whole thing started is a transaction. When the transaction concludes, when the beer is actually moving to a refrigerator, that transaction at least for the for the grocery store part needs to move. But if I actually help you to carry that beer, then I will be able to access some of the information for that beer to carry your refrigerator. That is a continuation. Yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it is possible to still like accept information on the time because okay, we're dealing like if it's a network that you're removing the information from to a localized host, so can it set the packet, right? Um, okay, so it, it, it might, it might, because even if you encrypt it, even if you encrypt it, you transmit, uh, right now the quantum uh, cryptography is so strong, they can actually encrypt. Yes, that's true. Um, so to answer that question, um, the way uh, we do, that's why I actually skipped one part is, is the file system. You can actually enhance that. You enhance, how do I enhance that? Is that when I want to save the information to the, to the say my private file or public cloud, I'm going to do it in a way such that I'm going to scramble it with different routes. Say some of my information I'm going to store in AWS. Some of this to Microsoft um, um, cloud system. Some of the information may be to Google. And the thing is that there is a networking issue is how whether there is a there is a point that you can intercept all this multiple uh, segment about my information. If you can actually do that, I'm still vulnerable. But I think um, in general we assume if that's going to happen, you actually only compromise like one user's information, and it's, it's still much more difficult for you to compromise in a big way. Say. Uh, when Target, by the way, Target actually lost, uh, I don't know how many million of their account information just because of one software vulnerability. That's, it's not going to be solving all this problem related to that, but it's actually a lot stronger. And especially, it's, it's actually um, in order for us to do that, because, because remember, all this computation involves some element of human being. And each human, because their behavior, is going to introduce some difference. And therefore, it is a lot harder for, 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 if I want to deal with Microsoft operating system, I know how many version, how many patch they have. And I can actually fingerprint and decide what is a vulnerability to target this and that. But for human, understand human being, we're actually still far away from that. So I'm actually using that uh, disadvantage as an advantage to actually reduce the vulnerability. It's just, just my dream. By the way, I'm actually working on cybersecurity for, for, for my whole career. I, I realized that um, to have a fully connected internet, it's actually quite dangerous. <laughs> Whenever it's a fully connected, there is a global chance for us to fail. So that's why I'm actually thinking, how do we actually be able to break that um, myth about having to have everybody connect together? For example, um, um, if you think about the internet protocol, internet protocol, why we have IPv6, we want to make sure that everything is connected. So it's very convenient for us to sit one place to access to everything else that relevant to us. But that exposed us to maybe a greater level of danger. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. For the human carrier, um, like, are they adhering on the physical device that, that attaches with the Raspberry Pi? Are they also carrying a Raspberry Pi? Like, no, they, 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 they use their smartphone. Okay. So, so they're using smartphone. I'm actually connected with uh, with a Raspberry Pi with either Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi. Okay. Yeah. How do you keep it safe on the smartphone? 
how do I keep it safe on the smartphone? Yeah, that's 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 something I haven't I haven't worked on that. But if your smartphone has has some uh, uh, sniffer be installed by some of the famous company, yes, everything they can actually catch. So that's why in your smartphone, I have in my smartphone, I have to assume I have to assume because I haven't built it. I have to assume I have a software that everything that I actually see from that Raspberry Pi computation will be will not leak. There is no information flow from that particular database, from that application to any other place. So there is a called inter information flow interference. That's that's the cybersecurity principle. And we want to make sure that. And also we need to store somewhere because our phone is actually going to be limited. And therefore, that's why I say I'm going to use a distributed uh, cloud to do that. So say I mean, just example using three. So I actually for every block of the information, I encrypt it and then break it into three parts for every block and send to all three. Just a very simple example. And this at least reduce uh the, the, yes, our phone cannot be compromised. If a phone get compromised, then that's the, the whole thing will work. No, no, that's great. Great question. I love that. Like, um, like how would you incorporate some like, I mean, people who can't afford to have a smartphone? So how would you be able to like include that? Ah, that's actually an excellent question. That was actually my conversation with one of a group of my students uh, when they talk about low income family. Yeah. And this is my thinking. I said at least in the Bay Area. If we actually have a really good uh, system, we need donors. We need people who actually be able to afford. I mean, we should not um, give less than the best of the product for those who cannot afford. I think that is actually ethical itself. Is that I think our our society, at least in the small scale, that we need to actually provide it as a first generational product. Once this becomes commodity. Once the technology mature, by the way, this is totally immature. This will take a year if it ever reaches that maturity. Once it reaches that maturity, then we believe that uh, the technology will be really inexpensive. And the smartphone will include all the security feature that we're talking about. It's going to be quite different than today, but it's going to be uh, much less expensive. And I think, and I think, um in my mind that this will be almost like a utility one day this mean, mean meaning that we have to provide this utility to to everybody just like we need to provide electricity and i i think that is uh um, um and, and the thing is we're not talking about this is really expensive infrastructure we're talking about a a very basic infrastructure that allow us to do a lot of things that's a good question. I, I think we, we should. I mean, my just be honest with my conversation with one of the students, they actually want to change the design because they think it's too expensive. Um, I, I feel that we shouldn't let that economic factor push us to do something good for, for, for anybody. I mean, regardless of your low income, high income family, we should actually do Okay. Excellent question. So I will see you on Thursday. All right. I will upload the lecture um, a bit later. Hey, any question from remote? I totally forgot about you. Uh, hi, Professor. Yeah, we have 11 students from remote. Hi, Professor. Hello, Professor. <laughs>